Good morning, everyone. It's great to see each and every one of you here this morning, to all those joining us online. And a special welcome to Lieutenant Colonel J.P. Pendergast and the Regimental Sergeant Major, Chief Warrant Officer Trace, and the officers and soldiers of the Prince Edward Island Regiment who are worshiping with us today. Please be seated, everyone. It's always a pleasure to have the regiment with us. And we are so pleased that you've decided to celebrate on Remembrance Day honoring our veterans service with us. As we gather this day to worship God and to give thanks for all those who have served our country and ultimately each one of us. They served in time of war out of a sense of duty to God and in service to our country. They endured the horrors of war so that we could live in freedom and so we have gathered together to remember them and to honor their service and sacrifice to ensure that they are never forgotten. We also gather with profound gratitude to God for our lives, for all that we enjoy, and the freedom we have to come together to worship. As we read in Psalm 122, I was glad when they said to me, let us go to the house of the Lord to give thanks to the name of the Lord our God. And as we begin our service this day, let us pray. Loving God, as we gather together this morning, we come with gratitude for all those who have served in time of war to bring peace to our country and give us the freedoms we enjoy each and every day. Lord God, we also give thanks this day with gratitude for the sacrifice Jesus made for each one of us on the cross a sacrifice that gives us freedom from sin and oppression and assures us of eternal life with you in the kingdom of heaven. As we take time this morning to remember and to give thanks, we pray that we will bring honor to the courage and sacrifice of those who have served our country, and most of all, that what we say and do will bring honor to you, our God and Savior. And as we begin our time of worship together this day, we pray using the words that Jesus taught us, saying, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. And our opening hymn this morning is, O oh God, our help in ages past.
children to come forward.
And as we bow our heads, we have our prayer of confession. Let us pray. Our merciful and loving God, as we bow our heads in your presence, we admit that although you call us to be people of peace, we often fail to be peacemakers. We confess to you that so often we are caught up in ourselves, what we think, what we need, and what we want. And it causes tension between us and divides us one from another. We also confess to you that so often when faced with disagreements, we are more concerned with being right than with finding peaceful compromise and solutions. And so we pray you will forgive us, Lord. Remind us that peace comes first and foremost through our relationship with you and then our relationships with each other. Help each one of us to seek to be in unity despite our individual differences and to work together in your name so that we will make a difference for good in this world. Loving God, we pray too that you will help us to better appreciate the many blessings and freedoms we so often take for granted. Our families, our friends, our work, the peace we enjoy, and the freedom we have to gather here together to worship you. Things for which others fought and sacrificed so that we could have them. Help us to better appreciate the sacrifices that others have made on our behalf and for our sake. And Lord, help us to better appreciate our faith and the difference it makes, to more fully appreciate the sacrifice Jesus made on our behalf and for our sake. And all these things we pray in and through his name. Amen. Amen. Hear the good news. The good news of the gospel is that Christ died so that we might live. And through his sacrifice, we have been forgiven. Thanks be to God. Amen. Now I invite you to turn in your pew Bible to page 503 for our responsive reading, which is Psalm 27, and Scott is going to come forward and lead us. Psalm 27, triumphant song of confidence of David. The Lord is my light and my salvation, whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life, of whom shall I be afraid? When evildoers assail me to devour my flesh, my adversaries and foes, they shall stumble and fall. Though an army encamp against me, my heart shall not fear. The war rise up against me, yet I will be confident. One thing I ask of the Lord, that will I seek after, to live in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to behold the beauty of the Lord, and to inquire in his temple. For he will hide me in his shelter in the day of trouble. He will conceal me under the cover of his tent. He will set me high on a rock. Now my head is lifted up above my enemies all around me, and I will offer in his tent sacrifices with shouts of joy. I will sing and make melody to the Lord. Hear, O Lord, when I cry aloud. Be gracious to me and answer me. Come, my heart says, seek his face. Your face, Lord, do I seek. Do, do not hide your face from me. Do not turn your servant away in anger. You who have been my help, do not cast me off. Do not forsake me, O God of my salvation. If my father and mother forsake me, the Lord will take me up. Teach me your way, O Lord, and lead me in a level path because of my enemies. Do not give me up to the will of my adversaries, for false witnesses have risen against me and they are reading out violence. I believe that I shall see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Wait for the Lord, be strong, and let your heart take courage. Wait for the Lord.
be seated. Thank you, Scott. And let's take a moment now to pray to dedicate the offering and to ask God to give us wisdom and understanding as we hear his word. Let us pray. Dear God, as we present our offering this day, we pray that it will help us as a church family to reach out in your name to our community and beyond so that the good news of you and your love will be spread far and wide. And as we thank you, Lord, for all you have given to us, we thank you for giving us your word. We thank you for the way it teaches us, leads us, guides us, and directs us. And by the power of your spirit, help us to understand what we hear this day. And as we listen to Tom's dramatic presentation, may we listen carefully to this true story that he will share with us. And may all that we hear increase our faith. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Actually, just a few announcements to share with you. Should have reversed the order of that, sorry. Um, we want to thank Peter Bevan Baker. There's Peter. Peter, thank you so much for being here once again for our annual Honoring Our Veterans Remembrance Service. It's always a blessing to have you with us, so thank you. Uh, Susie would like me to announce that youth group is meeting tomorrow night at 6.30 here at the church, so... Uh, youth and parents, just a reminder, tomorrow night at 6.30. And we want to acknowledge that today's bulletin is dedicated in loving memory of Reginald Reed, veteran of the Second World War and a charter member here at St. Mark's. And a donation has been made to St. Mark's in Reg's memory by Malcolm, Barclay, Paula, and Anne and their families. And our thanks and appreciation today as well to the members of the Prince Edward Island Regiment. And we want to honor all of those in our midst who have served or who are serving in the Canadian Armed Forces. And also if there are any first responders in our midst this morning. And we would like to ask you to stand so that we can show our grateful appreciation to you. <laughs> each and every day. And yes, please be seated. And I would like to ask Lieutenant Colonel Pendergast to come forward for our scripture passage. A reading from John, chapter 15, verses 9 to 17. Jesus said, As the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. I've said these things to you so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. No one has greater love than this, to lay down one's life for one's friends. You are my friends if you do what I command you. I do not call you servants any longer because the servant does not know what the master is doing. But I have called you friends because I have made known unto you everything that I have heard from my father. You did not choose me, but I chose you. And I appointed you to go and bear fruit, fruit that will last so that the Father will give you whatever you ask him in my name. I am giving you these commands so that you may love one another. Thank you, sir. The First World War was called the Great War and the war to end all wars because of the sheer magnitude of its destruction and the number of lives sacrificed. <clears throat> Every year, Remembrance Day marks another anniversary of the end of the First World War, which occurred on the 11th hour of the 11th day of the 11th month 
in 1918. In the wee hours of the morning of November 11, 1918, the German and Allied delegations had boarded a railway car on a siding in a French forest. At 5 a.m., they signed an armistice which declared that fighting would end at 11 a.m. It took about an hour and a half for the news to reach Canadian Corps headquarters. From there, it was dispersed to the four divisions, then to the 12 brigades, then down to 48 support battalions and support units. From battalion headquarters, it would be more difficult to tell units at the front the good news. Because of the rapid Allied advance, Canadians were scattered along the front, isolated and difficult to find as they moved forward along country lanes, through woods, and across fields. The foremost unit was the 28th Northwest Battalion advancing south of Mons, Belgium, against enemy fire. At 10.30, news of the armistice reached the front at the village of Havre. But a half a mile ahead, five young Canadians were still advancing against the enemy, unaware that the war would be over in half an hour. Let's go back in time, but not to 1918. We're going to go back to 1968, 50 years after the First World War ended, and we're going to meet one of the soldiers who was there the morning of November 11th, 1918. Can you believe it? The war is finally over. I kept hearing those words over and over again in the afternoon of November the 11th, 1918. And soldiers were slapping each other on the back. Some were hugging, some were singing, others were writing letters home, and some were quiet. But we were all thinking, can you believe it? The war is finally over. When I was serving in France for years during the First World War, I would wake up every morning and ask myself, what kind of day will this be like? Will we be repairing our trenches? Will we be attacking the enemy? Will we be defending ourselves against an enemy attack, against enemy mortars? No more mud. <laughs> no more lice. No more rats, no more disease, and no more death. We could hardly believe it that the war was finally over. It's been decades since I've put on this old uniform, and putting it on brings back so many memories especially in that last day of the war that will stand out above all the rest. We were just east of the Belgian town of Havre, and we had approached a canal, the Canal du Nord. And over the canal was a bridge to the other side, <clears throat> and on the other side was a small Belgian village, ville sur -Hain. And it had a central street with three-story high brick row houses and there was a grassy knoll to one side. Our company commander, Major Blondie Ross, told us that we were tasked with securing that village. And I looked at some of the homes on the other side of the bridge, and I was worried because I saw loopholes. And loopholes are those little gaps, narrow gaps around windows and doors, just wide enough for the enemy to slide a rifle through. And then I looked at the grassy knoll on the right-hand side, and I saw a German machine gun crew setting up their weapon. And I slithered forward for a better look when I heard a voice behind me say, Murph, what are you looking at? It was my best friend, Private George Price. I told him I was concerned about those loopholes and the machine gun and that we needed to take care of it, and he agreed and said we should call our section. Then George reached up here, and I knew exactly what he was reaching for. It was the crocheted flower that he carried with him everywhere. This is where most soldiers carried their pocket Bible, 
In addition to that, George had that crocheted flower, and it had been given to him by his sweetheart back in Saskatchewan. And George carried it everywhere. Well, we called our section together, and we crouched over, and we dashed across the bridge, and we came to the first house. And with our rifles drawn, we kicked in the door like a group of gangsters, and inside was Monsieur Stavenard and his young son, Ulmer. We made our way up to the top floor and we saw German tools and spent casings. And apparently the enemy had seen us on the other side of the bridge and had hightailed it out the back door. We went to the next house. It was owned by an elderly couple, the Lenores, who greeted us as liberators. And as we were speaking to them, we heard the sound of enemy machine gun fire. And German machine gun bullets were knocking the tile off of roofs and also pockmarking the walls. With the shelter of the houses, George and I stepped into the, the main street. And we looked at the bridge. And it looked like an emery wheel, the way the enemy's machine gun bullets were ricocheting off the ironwork. And there was no way anyone was going to get across that bridge. We decided to step back inside the Lenore's house. It was five minutes before 11 a.m. on November the 11th, 1918. And we didn't realize it then, but we were actually on the very edge of the entire Allied attack. After a few moments, we decided to step back into the street. and. Uh, we lifted the latch and we stepped on the cobblestones and we noticed that there was a lone German soldier crouched out by the side of the canal, racing as fast as he could. He couldn't see us and we could see him, but there was no way we were going to take a shot at him. He was just trying to get back to his unit out of harm's way. Beyond him, we looked to the bridge, still under enemy fire, and we saw that more of our comrades from the 28th Battalion were on the other side of the canal. And from their vantage point, they were about to witness the final scene for Canadians in the First World War. And there was another eyewitness that day. Across the road was Mademoiselle Alice Grote, a 23-year-old Belgian nurse. And she saw George and I step into the street. And as George and I were talking, it was as if time stood still. George was facing me and I was talking to him. And then suddenly we heard a bang! George fell forward. I caught him and I could have cried. It wasn't an accidental shot. It was from a sniper at the end of the street. Alice had seen George shot, and, and even though it put her in full danger to the enemy, she raced into the street, and together we, we dragged George back inside the Lenore's home. And at that point, everyone tried to help. Madame Lenore tried to feed George some broth, and Alice tried to stop the bleeding, and I held my best friend. I held him as he breathed his last and died. It was 10.58 a.m. And then we heard something that we hadn't heard in more than four years of war. We heard silence. No mortars exploded. No machine gun rounds. No rifles fired. Silence. And then from far away, we might have heard the sound of church bells, or even what might have been people shouting in jubilation. But we gathered the spent remains of our comrade and our friend, and we carried him across the bridge back to our company commander. And Major Ross saw us, and he exclaimed, But the war's over! The war's over! The war is over? No one told us the war was over. How could we have known? The 
kind people of Vilser Hain begged us to be allowed to bury George as their hero and provide a coffin. But like every Canadian who fell in combat in the First World War, his body was wrapped in a blanket and he was lowered into the ground. But before he was buried, there was one thing that was not buried with George. As he was dying, he passed the crocheted flower, now blood-stained, to Alice. And Alice kept that crocheted flower. She framed it. And she put it on her wall and looked at it every day. And then before she died, she passed it on to her daughter. As George's body was lowered into the ground, I wept for my best friend. The last soldier to be killed from the 28th Battalion, the last Canadian to die in action during the First World War. But George is so much more than just an important statistic. To his grieving parents back home in Port Williams, Nova Scotia, he was their beloved son. And to me, he was my best friend. It has been five decades, 50 years, since that day. And I have just come from the dedication of a plaque, unveiled in George's memory on the home of the Lenores in ville sur it means a lot that George's impact resonates with the people of Ville sur And I wonder if George's impact means anything to the people back home in Canada. In fact, I wonder if decades from now, Canadians will even remember the sacrifice of Private George Lawrence Price. I know one thing. I will remember him for the rest of my life. At 11 o'clock on November 11th, 1918, the guns fell silent, and soon after came the sound of cheering and church bells ringing. That afternoon, Canadian soldiers marched in a victory parade through Mons. But for Private Art Good Murphy and the others, the Armistice celebration was bittersweet. Art promised to never forget George, and he was true to his word. Fifty years later, Art Good Murphy led a group of fellow veterans back to Ville sur -Hain, and on November 11, 1968, they unveiled a plaque which read, To the memory of 25625, Private George Lawrence Price, 28th Northwest Battalion, 6th Canadian Infantry Brigade, 2nd Canadian Division, killed in action near this spot at 10.58 hours, November 11, 1918. The last Canadian soldier to die on the Western Front in the First World War, erected by his comrades November 11, 1968. For the rest of his life, Art grieved the loss of his friend, not only the last Canadian, but in fact the last Commonwealth soldier to die in the First World War. And just as an aside, the flower that Alice had preserved and gave to her daughter has since been given to George's great nephew who lives in Nova Scotia. It's now 105 years since that fateful day. But George's death continues to have an impact on the village of ville -Hain. In September, we had the privilege of traveling in Belgium and went to ville -Hain, to the street, which you can see on screen, where George died. In 2018, on the 100th anniversary of the armistice, a new park was opened in ville -Hain, called the Price Memorial. The hedges are meant to represent the trenches of the war. At the center of the park is a sculpture called Impact. The sculpture depicts a drop of blood and the impact as it falls to the ground, representing the lasting impact that George's death had on Vilser Hain, an impact that continues to reverberate to this day. 
The footbridge that crosses the canal is named after him. And at the base of that bridge is a small play park, and there's a Canadian flag where it's thought that George fell. The local elementary school bears his name, and everyone in the village feels connected to him, as though when he fell, they lost one of their own. While we were at the park, we chanced to speak to a woman who had come out to her gate to say goodbye to a visitor. And when she heard we were there because of George, she invited us to come into her house, telling us she had a photograph she wanted to show to us. There on the wall of her dining room was a framed photo of George. George's parents had given the framed photo to her husband's parents. And so Marilyn LaHaye feels a deep connection to George and keeps his photo in a place of prominence on the wall of her dining room. Afterwards, we drove to St. Symphorian Military Cemetery where George is buried. We first went to the register book, and you can see by the red arrow is the list, listing of George's grave. The cemetery is very peaceful and park-like in its beauty. And I have to tell you that kneeling at George's grave was poignant and deeply moving. And we felt that same deep connection the people of Vilserhain feel. It's as though George Price is family. In a remarkable coincidence, a stone's throw from George's grave is the grave of British soldier John Parr, the first Allied soldier to die in the First World War in 1914. But today, our hearts and minds are focused on George Lawrence Price and the lasting impact of his life and death. He is a reminder to each one of us of the tens of thousands who sacrificed their lives to preserve our freedom and our way of life. And so today we honor and give thanks for George Lawrence Price. And as we reflect on George's sacrifice, the choir is going to sing, I do not sleep.
As we begin our act of remembrance this morning, I'd like to invite Lieutenant Colonel Pendergast and Chief Warrant Officer Trace to bring the memorial wreath. Would you please stand?
they shall grow not old, as we that are left grow old. Age shall not weary them, nor the years condemn. At the going down of the sun and in the morning, we will remember them. We will remember them. Let us pray. Almighty God, we remember and give thanks this day all those who have so willingly served our country. We give thanks for the sacrifices they made so that we would continue to live in freedom. We thank you too for those who continue to serve so that we can continue to live in freedom. And we ask you to please watch over and protect them. Lord God, we live in a selfish and self-serving world where people are focused on themselves and their own personal gain. But Remembrance Day reminds us of those who have done the opposite. <coughs> and so today we give thanks for all those who gave their lives in service to our country. We think of George Lawrence Price and all the fallen. Please help us to preserve their memory and to work diligently to maintain the peace that they gave their lives for. Most of all, may we never forget the debt we owe to those who gave of themselves for our sake. May the memory of their service and devotion inspire each one of us to live our lives in ways that serve and bless others. And we pray all this in the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, who made the ultimate sacrifice for each and every one of us to give us life here and in eternity. Amen. Amen. of the regiment and to thank them for their service to our country and to each one of us and a time of fellowship for all. So please join us in the hall. And our closing hymn this morning is O Valiant Hearts.
us pray. The Lord bless you and keep you. And the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. And the Lord lift up the light of his countenance upon you to fill you with his peace this day and forevermore. Amen. Amen.